Hello. <clears throat> Hello. How are you? All right. How are you? I'm great. Good. Um, nice to see you. So I, I've, I've been uh, looking at your messages in the Slack, and so uh, I, yeah, we can talk about that today. Um, so do you know if Fujiwara is coming? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, he informed me. So actually, uh, he has another meeting today, so he might not try. Okay, that's okay. Um, you can pass along everything to him if we. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. All right. So welcome to the meeting. Uh, we're going to get started. We're going to talk about the digital basilaria stuff, and it looks like the Rune and Esmet are here. Then we'll go on to some papers and uh, some other uh, submission information and maybe some other people will show up during the meeting we'll see it's usually what happens so uh so why don't we start with talking about uh therun and azimut and your progress on the digital basilary images sure yeah i guess therun can take over and basically uh, describe uh, the uh, the updates we have for the last couple of weeks and what all the other stuff we have Okay. Yes. So, like, uh, we were like trying to like make uh, those bounding box kind of uh, figures on the overlapping uh, objects, but uh, I think the model is not performing well because we have like only one video, and uh, most of the images that we got from the video are like blurry and out of focus. And uh, yeah, so I guess we need to find a bigger data set so we can train the model on that and uh, improve the results. Okay. Uh, so as far as I remember, so like for the other cases where they are not overlapping, for that we have pretty good results, right? Yeah, yeah, for that we have uh, good results. Yeah, that's nice. So I was looking at the video you just uh, shared on the Slack channel. So uh, like within that, between I guess 20 seconds to around 30 seconds range, like, Cannot we, like, can't we just break that part of 10 seconds into individual frames and maybe that is a good enough data set, like, uh, is, it shouldn't that be the case or, like, uh, is it not enough for the model to get framed on? I did try the whole video, like, I removed the images which were, like, because the, the, the colonies were moving slowly, so, so many images were repeated. Right. Uh, right. So those I removed, but at the end only I got around like 30 or 33 images for the whole video. So that was a oh. problem. Oh, okay, yeah. That's a bit less than, yeah. So, and, and like the results we get are like really off or they do show some sort of overlapping with that. Yeah, like so that. it for the overlapping ones, it just classifies the whole strand as one object. Okay, I see. So that's the problem. So yeah, like uh, as uh, Bradley was mentioning, we could do some sort of like, like pre-processing for these images. So like these boundaries are more refined. That maybe that helps the model capture those uh, boundaries in, in like a better way. So yeah, like at the like from the top of the mind, I can think of like basic uh, water shedding or like these can edge detection techniques or like just basically sharpening the edges of, of these uh, colonies so we could try these like different filters we have we have gamma filter log filter like all these image filters that we have we can try that and like basically just uh, uh, from the 30 images we can build a data set of 90 or 120 or like 30x images just by feeding in uh, 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 like pro uh, pre-processed images to the model but uh, but then, like us, uh, if we if we feed to the model a set of a mixture of images with different filters, we will have to make sure that for the normal case as well, we do the same. So like, if, uh, we can't just uh, give the model a sort of mixed set of processed images for just the overlap case. If we do so, then uh, I guess we would have to do that for the normal case. Also. Yeah, I guess we can try that. And if other than this video, we have any other video uh, for this overlap in case, then like, that would be really helpful. I guess that's not the case. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess we have the ones, the only data that we have are the, the, the folders that I shared uh, in the 
on media fire and then i i have we have the uh original data set that we were working from but that that isn't very big that's just a ser a couple of movies that we have so that's yeah but uh I, I wouldn't, you know, I wonder if there isn't some way to take, like, well, there might be some way to take the entire colony and, and sort of do an ad hoc type of classification where, you know, you just look at the movement across cells. Like, you don't worry about the uh, single, let me, actually, let me uh, share my screen. I'm going to do some drawing here on the board there. All right. So can you see my screen? Yeah, it's just... So I guess the what you're saying is that you, what you have is, like, if this is a colony here, and we have a bunch of cells here that are, are aligned like this in a colony, that the algorithm doesn't pick up the individual cells, it just kind of picks up the colony like this. And this is an object. Is that what it looks like, sort of? Uh, I guess for this particular case, it works pretty well, but the case where it's not working well is when, uh, like in the left, left hand side image, if the two cells are overlapping, so like uh, the second rectangle has some overlap with the first rectangle. Okay, so, so that's in two. Yeah, if, if these two have some sort of an overlap, uh, so like two rectangles and uh, along their length, they're overlapping. So in that case, it basically captures it as one long rectangle instead of two vertical rectangles one over the other. So it'll capture yeah. like this or? Yeah, so something like that. But uh, in the cases where it's not performing well, I guess uh, the thing is that the second cell is uh, actually much more vertically, uh, like uh, vertically down and not uh, like horizontally shifted. So in these cases, I believe uh, it pretty much captures it really well that uh, since since this two so like uh, as a human also like if we perceive this it's pretty clear that these are two rectangles but when the second rectangle is vertically down like when the uh, when the colony is extended to its maximum sort of vertical length then the rectangles will be vertically over one another right so in that case i guess uh, uh Tharun can point out if, it, uh, if i'm saying something wrong but i guess in that case it's when the module is not performing well Okay. Yeah, when the objects are like one below the other and they're like a yeah. bit overlapped, okay. so mm -hmm. that time it's not able to. Uh, maybe like uh, uh, if you can share the link to the Jamboard, we can draw uh, a sample to show if it's not there. Yeah, uh, let's see. Here you go. Uh, let me put it in the chat here. All right, I think, yeah, it should be shareable. Yeah, uh, just a second. Yeah, uh, I'll just uh, request for permission. So you should receive a notification. Me, actually, let me make sure here. Yeah. Be able to do it. Uh, yeah. Okay, now reload it. I should have the permission. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it works. Right. Yeah, so I guess uh, the cases where it's not performing as well as when this slide, like these are really uh, let like they're distributed vertically, and there's not as much uh, horizontal displacement. Oh, so this is... in these cases, when they so so in this case, uh, like the model is not picking up that these are two different rectangles, and it's like basically considering this as one big rectangle. Okay. Uh, this is the case, right? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Okay. So this is kind of like where it stretches to its maximum, right? Like yeah. The, yeah. The ends. Okay. Well, you know, there's there are some ways you can deal with that. Like you could go back and say that, like, you know, you could provide, I don't know how, well, let's see, how would you do this? I mean, you basically know that, like, the cell is of a certain length. So you can, you know, you can limit your mm, rectangle yeah. to that size and then it would just like, if it's that, if it's twice the length or near twice the length, then it might like, you know, be able to uh, find a boundary. It wouldn't be the exact size of the cell, but it would like dif differentiate the cells. Um, 
And then, you know, yeah. I was talking about data augmentation where, you know, you have, you know, in data augmentation as a method, you have, uh, like, you basically take the data and you stretch it out in different ways. So, you know, you modify, you, you introduce some variation to the uh, data set. And so in that way, you can actually, you know, maybe train it on a number of uh, different uh, cell boundaries in that case. Like for those cases, you know, you might have like something where, you know, you, you actually define the boundary somehow. I know we were drawing, like right. at one time, like I remember doing this where we would draw boundaries uh, for a very small training set, like, you know, it, within a embryo, we'd have like, you know, we could dif differentiate most of the boundaries of the cells, but there were still some trouble spots. So we just did it by hand for a very small training set and then, you know, train it on those boundaries. So it kind of, you know, you kind of fill out what it's missing. So it's missing that where it's oriented at that sort of that um, vertical orientation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a good idea. So one thing we could maybe try is that, uh, like, we could train it as it is, what it is, and like for the cases, it's not the final, as Brad mentioned, the length of the rectangle is like order of two times uh, your all other population cells. So like you can just break it in half or like do some sort of post, like after like after the classification is done, after, after the segmentation is done, mm -hmm. then, then we can move on to something like dividing the cells into two parts, that's one approach. And another thing that uh, you're mentioning is that we can like, uh, Pre process uh, like initially and define like uh, increase the definition of those boundaries so like model can pick that up maybe. so we can try this to approach it I guess yeah looks like my knocks here Hi, my knock um, y did you have anything to add to the conversation or any suggestions not really I was actually it was sort of interesting to see like the way the algorithm works and the and the approach so yeah I'll, I'll try to look into it it seems interesting actually yeah 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 um, okay that's good um Tarun, did you have anything to add yeah but like uh, the problem is like when we put constraints over the like length or something then we need to consider only one zoom like there are two like two or three types of zoom like 20x and 40x so then to make it zoom invariant, then that would become a problem. So like what's coming in my mind is that like since we'll be working with a video, right? So like for for some part of the video, our model would perform like uh, at high accuracy. So for that part, we have an idea of the num like the population value or the number of cells that are there in the current frame. And uh, so so when we move to the next frame and like if it's if the pop, like if the colony is at its max stretch, then if we see that the like the value suddenly or the number of cells being detected suddenly decrease right so we have an indication that uh, uh, there's some problem and the model is not performing well and then maybe we can do that but yeah it's, it's a bit of a hacky way to do but like, like the best thing would to do would be to uh, add some samples in the training set uh, somehow and like uh, increase increase what the model is saying so like coming back to that we could try some uh, pre-processing methods to just increase the definition of the cells and just add on to the existing set of images. Maybe that might help. I'm not sure if you have to try. Yes, yeah, so this would become part of the post-processing. So yeah, we can try this. So we can start with a like when we are uh, yeah when you're making predictions, then we can like uh, take some mean of the like sizes okay. of what are the objects okay. which are getting detected and. We can like find the average length of each object, so, so we can do that, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, so like uh, with the existing model only, so like do we have an idea of how to move forward with this? In the sense that now we have a uh, we have a new image on a black background with these white rectangles. So, uh, like, are you clear with the idea how would we basically extract the coordinates from these rectangles? Yeah. So we thought of using like these. Uh, or can you direction or any other open CV techniques which yeah, are yeah. out there? Yeah, I, I like initially I was thinking that we could train some sort of a neural net, like just basically takes our image, uh, 
and just uh, throws up a, a vector of these coordinates. But I, I think that's like that's that's an overkill way because or these open CV techniques I just took that uh, they perform pretty well since it's like a wide rectangle on a black so it should uh, should be fine. Right? So we can detect basically rectangles out of the service. And yeah, like it would be exciting to see like once uh, how how many frames of a particular video uh, of an unseen video it detects correctly and then maybe we, then we can move on to like uh, interpolation techniques like whenever this module is performing bad or like within the frames the, if the number of uh, the like the mean population drops or something then we can look at some interpolation techniques to fill, to fill the video in again but yeah like uh, these results are pretty exciting Yeah, that sounds great. So that's great. Um, I know you said that like this is either going to work really well or not. <laughs> so when in I think in the last meeting we had on Friday. So uh, this this is good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think it's it uh, it sounds pretty good. It sounds like you're coming along. A little bit of a some uh, issues with you know, but this is probably normal because it's not you know you you do have a lot of things that where the focus changes and. So, you know, that's just, that's what happens when you're trying to observe a colony like that. And, uh, but that's, that's the nature of this data. So I think that should work though. Uh, right, we'll right. See. Yeah, we'll see how it works and you can report back. Um, it's great. So I know that, I don't know if everyone knows, but they're using this algorithm called pix to pix And this is an algorithm where, uh, did, did any uh, either of you want to explain what picks to picks is for uh, my knock? And yeah, like I just quickly give an overview. It's, it's basically a GAN based approach of uh, image to image translation. So it basically trains on a, a, on a bunch of sets. So like you have an input set and an output set. The input set is basically a image of one class. Like basically, if you're trying to uh, convert a given uh, image, like you have a satellite image of a map, right? Like in Google Maps, you have satellite uh, vision and you have this normal sort of, uh, this animated version where you have uh, like this uh, block lines, etc. So what if you wanted to convert the satellite image to this uh, other form somehow? So like it's a really great uh, approach. So what it basically does is just takes two sets as input. One would be a uh, set of satellite images and other would be this uh, uh, set we want to convert that particular image to. And then it trains on that and uh, so, so our idea was that we want to do segmentation, right? That like the typical segmentation techniques uh, or like these unit-based approaches were not really working well. So, uh, so we moved on, moved to this particular approach. So we uh, give, uh, give the model a set like set of video frames, uh, which are like obviously the microscopic uh, images, and and the expected output would be a black background with this white rectangles and each white rectangle would represent a cell. So we are basically trying to convert this particular image into a given form and we have these two sets and then we trained on that and uh, like uh, Tharun tried uh, training the model and it, it worked pretty well uh, most of the cases we tried and like as we were discussing today it's not really uh, performing well as of now for uh, the for some uh, corner cases but yeah like uh, like we had this idea and we tried it so it worked really well. Like I, I haven't uh, seen anywhere like uh, it's it's a particular approach that has a lot of applications and like a lot of problems. But uh, yeah, it was exciting to try it out in this one. Well, that's great. Yeah, thanks for that overview. Um, yeah, so we'll see you know how it works out when you uh, keep moving along on it. Hopefully, you know we get some pretty good results and we can you know do something really interesting with it. Uh, with the data, I mean, not with the technique. <laughs> with you know, then once we get the data, then you know, we might be able to do something interesting with it. And great, uh, I think we have uh, Karan. If if we have you been to a meeting before? Hello, hello. Okay. Am, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, I yeah, know this is this is my first time. No, I was just going through you know. Uh, your repos on GitHub and all, so I kind of found it. Okay, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Interesting. So, 
wanted to drop by. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, I am Karan. I am currently in my third year. I am doing engineering. Uh, another student here. And uh, apart from this, again, I am interested in both you know computer vision and its applications on specifically with this particular uh, group that will be computational biology. So you know, generating models and all based on the given data and also. Yeah, I'm just going through, you know, getting a general feel of, you know, uh, the kind of projects that are there and things that can be done, you know, all that. Yeah. Well, welcome. And uh, we, yeah, so we have our Slack channel. And if you're interested in, are you in the Slack, I think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I joined okay. the Slack from that, from those links, you know. Okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, and so, you know, if you want to ask questions about anything, you can read it in the Slack. We have a what we call the Devo Arm Slack, which is the general Slack channel. Then we have the Devo Learn channel, which is if you're interested in Devo Learn, which is something that my knock is involved with, um, then, you know, you can, and this is like a, a, a pre-trained model for uh, uh, cell segmentation in embryos. Uh, you can join that group and, you know, that's more technical uh, around the issues surrounding Devo Learn. Uh, but, you know, you can ask general questions, I guess, about computer vision and, and about machine learning in that channel as well. So we have a lot of people who are interested in machine learning and computer vision, as you've just heard, and a lot of people using, trying to use different techniques. We have uh, open data sets, so we have, uh, you know, we have a, a diatom species called Basilaria, uh, which is this colony of uh, these rod-shaped cells that move. Uh, in different ways. We have uh, C. elegans, of course, which is the uh, nematode. So, you know, we look at the embryo of that. So, uh, usually you have a relatively small embryo that has labeled data that you can use. Uh, you know, you can connect the labels to the cells as they're dividing. So, that's actually a very nice model for doing interesting things. And then we have other data. We have, um, we have a uh, things like axolotl data that we you know we can anal analyze uh, that's a little bit more challenging um, but that's something that is available and you can work on that as well so welcome to the group and if you have any questions you know put the questions in slack or you know look over the github repos and um, we have the open issues but you know some of those open issues are pretty broad so i don't know if you can necessarily some of them you can't really address directly. You have to sort of inquire about them. So um, that's just kind of the nature of how we're doing a lot of work here because we're doing like, you know, a lot of the computational stuff, but we do a lot of, you know, we're kind of connected to data sets and biology. And so that's good. Uh, Susan's here. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Definitely okay. follow up with that. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll reduce my bandwidth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how are you doing, Susan? Um, okay, I'm still working on my thesis presentation, so it seems to be taking a lot of my time. Yeah. <laughs> I keep hoping to get a couple of things done for for this chat, at least just a short presentation. I'm well, I'll get there. It's just, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just, I need to do the other thing. And yeah. Yeah. My, the professor yeah. I'm working with wants to see it done yesterday. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> yes, of <Yeah>. course. <laughs> well, good. Um, welcome. So let's see. Next thing I want to talk about was, uh, we have a couple of things, uh, you know, ongoing. I always do this in every meeting. I go through a couple of things that we have. So the submissions, so we you know we're working on different submissions uh, and some of these are kind of still out, you know, outstanding. Uh, we have a couple of conferences coming up in December. Uh, there's NeuroMatch 4.0. So this is a computational neuroscience conference. But, you know, they also do uh, some machine learning and deep learning in this group. Uh, this is a online conference. It's, you know, it has a nominal fee, but it can be free. You can request a, uh, a waiver. Uh, it's December 1 and 2. So 
Um, if you're interested in that area, of course, uh, go to that conference. Uh, uh, we're not submitting anything from this group, but my other group is submitting a couple things. And as thinking of having something in conjunction with this, um, I don't know what exactly yet. It could be on a regular time on Monday. It could be uh, some other time during the week. But, uh, it, you know, I was thinking about doing something with, um, you know, maybe inviting people from that community to see some of the things we're doing in Diva Worm. So uh, more information about that. It might be just as simple as an overview uh, for people. But I definitely want to take advantage of this in some way. Uh, then there's also NeurIPS, and this is happening in early December, and uh, the submissions for that are closed, but I wanted to point out that this is also virtual, and if you're interested in uh, machine learning, deep learning, this is something that you can attend, or um, as Jesse, who's a member of our group, has done, you can apply. I don't know if you can still apply to volunteer, but you can volunteer for uh, NeurIPS, and you can attend the conference for free and you can actually see the inner workings of the conference and you know it's a nice opportunity for students so those are two things coming up uh we have the, some of these other things like uh, uh quantitative comparison of archaea and shape droplets uh this is something that's kind of outstanding um we you know had a, some conversations about this um and it's basically taking single cells and uh, looking at their shape and classifying the shape. I think my knock was working on that at one point. I don't know if he, uh, if he made any progress on that or not. Um, we also have the mathematics of Diva Worm, which is this, um, it, it's supposed, it's gonna be like a paper of different uh, mathematical models we use in Diva Worm. So this is something that is currently kind of in a poster form and it needs to be fleshed out into a paper. Um, I haven't worked on it in a while, but it's something we'll come back to. Um, this, uh, where is it? There's a, oh yeah, the Diva Learn paper. This has been like very, very behind. I'm very, very behind on this, but we, uh, so for the Diva Learn platform, uh, we're developing this paper, which is like kind of like a technical paper on it. Uh, we need to fill it out. I, I promised that I would do it after the end of last uh, Google Summer of Code, but I have yet to get to it. So this is something that'll be kind of, I'll, I'll try to make a point to work on this a bit. Um, and this is something that my knock and, uh, and um, a couple other people are working on. Okay, Tharun says he has to go. I'll try some data augmentation techniques. Start with finding coordinates of the objects and get back. Have a nice week. Thank you for attending the room. Um, and so that, that's that's uh, so that's good. Um, and so yeah, we'll be working on that as well. So there are a lot of yeah. There's still some things that are outstanding. If you're interested in working on some defined problem, uh, we have some things here on diatoms. We have some other types of computational biology projects. Let us know where, what you might want to work on if there's something of interest here. Um, we also have our major tasks. So this is still technically Hacktoberfest, and this is uh, for 2021. So this is where you know we're kind of encouraging people to participate. And uh, we have someone here who saw the issues on GitHub, and they're looking them over. So that's good. Um, we also have some other things that are ongoing, some other papers. Um, this is in the group meeting. So if you go to Diva Worm, the group meetings repository, this is the project board there. And so there are all these issues. And like I said, the issues can be very broad. They can, you know, they're, some of them are very broad. So these are things that you need to sort of inquire about. Uh, a lot of these things are, if you attend the meetings, you know, there's things that maybe we've been working on for a while, so you know kind of what they are. But if you're just coming in, you might need to, a little bit more information on them. Uh, but we have a lot of outstanding things and we need to clean these up uh, at some point. So I think my, my philosophy has been, if you just take a little piece of something, you know, eventually we'll get through a lot of these things that are kind of outstanding. And um, I am doing that as well. And so this is a, 
a constantly evolving board here. Okay, um, so that's, I think that's all for that. Um, now, I wanted to get into some other uh, things and I wanna jump into this uh, papers folder. So one of the things I wanted to talk about today was this idea of topological data analysis. And let's see if it works. I have to reload it here. Okay. Yeah, it's waiting. I can't seem to open it up right off the bat here. Um, close some of these windows. Well, I'm kind of hoping it loads up or else we're <laughs> maybe not going to have very much of a meeting here. Um, Okay, let's see, let me go back. I think Google Drive is not working very well today. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> I didn't mean I want to do this, but I don't know if it's going to work. Um, Let me see if I can do this. I'll share this and uh, see if I can get. You happen to know if, uh, let's see, I was wondering if Susan could help me on this. I don't know if she'll be have any more luck on this than I do. But if you could like take this uh, dry, or I don't know if you can do that. I'd have to get into the folder to do this. Well, this thing is just like not, uh, Letting me go forward. I'm having trouble with my Gmail. No, my. Yeah, I think this is not really um, letting oh, me do this. Oh, there we go. Oh. So that, that was there a little go. better. Now it's, it, maybe it's coming in. It's working better than it was. Yeah, there we go. I think it's letting me in now. Okay. I don't know why yeah. I was stuck like that, but okay, there we go. Uh, so let's do the topological data analysis here. So I want to get into topological data analysis. Um, so this is something we've talked about and, and topological data analysis is this area of analysis that uh, basically you're ana analyzing shapes and you're, you're applying mathematical techniques and models to different shapes and you're using shapes to characterize data. And it's, it's a really interesting field and we haven't really gotten very far in it. Um, uh in general in terms of research but there are some tools that that exist on the web you know this is a, sort of an alternative to machine learning where you know you use a training set to um, analyze uh you know a, a testing set so you have some image set where you want to define things and you have to label them label things and then you have to train the, the model and then you end up with something that minimizes its error and then you end up with some sort of like analysis, you know, with numbers. So a topological data analysis doesn't really involve uh, too much training. It involves using tools to sort of quantify the shape and structure in data. So, uh, so yeah, so this is a collection of powerful tools that can quantify shape and structure in data in order to answer questions from the data's domain. This is done by representing some aspect of the structure of the data and a simplified topological signature. So topological means uh, something to do with shape. Uh, they use topology as, a, as a, a mathematical technique for looking at like, you know, different surfaces, different shapes. Usually it involves some sort of hole in a shape where you're looking at like a torus, where you're looking at something that has uh, some significant uh, geometric structure and you're looking at sort of the surface of that. So if you're familiar with, you know, like uh, a Riemannian uh, surface, like in theoretical physics, they'll often use that. And it's just a sort of a spherical projection of space. Um, and so, you know, there are different ways that you can do analyze this, different models you start with, and you analyze things that unfold on the space. 
So, you know, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll project data to a space and then they'll analyze it in that space. And there's a reason why they do this. Um, and so it, it, it sometimes it reveals a structure. Actually, if you're familiar with things like uh, principal component analysis, a lot of times you're projecting data points to sort of a, a manifold and you're, you know, rotating that manifold and you're finding the best fit. So that's not really topological data analysis, but it uses the same set of principles. So in this article, we introduced two of the most commonly used topological signatures. First, the persistence diagram represents loops and holes in the space by considering connectivity of the data points for a continuum of values rather than a single fixed value. So this is, uh, they have a persistence diagram, which is one tool. So you're representing different things like loops and holes in the space. You're considering connectivity. So we've talked about this with respect to graph theory where, or uh, complex networks where things are connected. And if they're connected, then they have this, you know, sometimes things aren't connected fully. They're, you know, different gaps in the connectivity. And so these are the things we want to know where those are. Um, and then, so that's one way. The second topological signature, the mapper graph, returns a one-dimensional structure representing the shape of the data and is particularly good for exploration and visualization of the data. Well, these techniques are based on very sophisticated mathematics. The current ubiquity of available software means that these tools are more accessible than ever. So this is uh, a nice little overview of some of this. Um, and so, yeah, this is kind of the same thing. And so, let's see. This article will serve as an introduction to the standard TDA methods for domain scientists. Uh, and uh, let's see. So data with distance. So, you know, the first thing you need to understand is that there's this idea that there's a distance between data points. And so when you have data points with a distance, oh, this thing ends here. Okay, so I didn't really get the whole thing. I got the first page. For some reason, that didn't copy over well. Well, anyways, uh, I thought we were going to go through a bit more here, but I think the idea here is that, you know, you have your data, it has a distance, you can configure the data on a surface, you can find the distance between points, then you can find sort of the structure between those points, and you can look for different ways, of, you know, different geometric relationships between them. And so there's a, it's, you know, I, I don't know, I didn't really want to go too deeply into sort of the methods without doing a demo, but um, this is something that we maybe we should follow up on. I don't have the right set of papers for this right now, but I wanted to like uh, go over, you know, just, just mention that in the meeting here. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is this paper. I, I actually did a review on this paper, and this is uh, Another, this is actually going towards uh, complex graph or complex network theory or graph theory. And this is called Resilience of Nematode Connect. It was based on network dimension reduced method. And so this is a, I, I was a reviewer on this paper. So I, this is an interesting paper. They talk about uh, the connectome of C. elegans, but they also talk about the connectome of Pristianca specificus, which is another nematode that is a predator of C. elegans. And so there's a, it, we don't really think about C. elegans being a prey species, but uh, the Pristianchus is its, its predator. And so what they do in this paper is they look at the, not only the connectome of C. elegans or the way the neurons are connected, but they also look at the uh, connectome of Pristianchus. And, you know, when you have a predator, there are certain differences in, you know, there's certain cells and certain circuits that exist that are, you know, predator specific. And so, um, so the abstract on this is the whole map of nematode connectomes provide important structural data for exploring the behavior mechanism of nematodes. But to further reveal the functional importance and resilience pattern of nematode neurons, it is necessary to effectively couple the regulatory relationship between neurons and their topology. So this is where they actually use a signal excitation function to propose a model of capturing the interacting relationship between neurons. 
So they actually have taken the structural data of the uh, of the connectome, and they're actually looking at the excite. They're using an excitation function in different cells, and they're able to look at maybe how these neurons work together in a circuit. And so this is something that OpenWorm is doing more generally. Uh, you know, uh, OpenWorm is using uh, software. They're using things like Neuron and some other types of uh, software to model the uh, electrical activity of neurons in the uh, connectome. And so you can do this for different circuits, like behavioral circuits, and you can get out, you know, you can get different behaviors. You can uh, simulate different behaviors. And so they're doing a similar thing here. Um, they're using this excitation function. They're uh, using this uh, a differential equation to depict the activity of a neuron. So they're not actually looking at the uh, ion channel activity, which is what they do in OpenWorm, but they're looking at a more sort of collapsed description, which is this differential equation uh, model. And so we need, because we have a lot of neurons, we need a high dimensional differential equation to capture the neural network. Uh, with mean field theory, we decouple this n-dimensional question into a one-dimensional problem. And then in this framework, we em emphatically analyze the characteristics, similarities, and differences of the structure and dynamical behaviors of the neuron sy neuronal system for these two species. And then they talk about comparing the results of simulating method and theoretical approach, show the most important homologous neurons between these two species, or I2 and NSM. So they're looking at the different connectomes for these two species, uh, and they find that there are some two uh, neurons which serve, you know, that are basically the same in both species, and I2 and NSM, which may lead to their different behavior characteristics of predation and prey. So that's interesting. They did this experiment where they took this data set from a group, um, you know, like a biological group, and they analyzed it using this method. So they got the connectomes, which is, you know, usually people will take like, they'll do uh, microscopy, they'll take what they call micrographs, and they'll look for um, gap junctions or they'll look for synaptic connections between cells, and then they'll mark it off and they'll be able to uh, take those images and construct a uh, connectome, which is just how the cells are connected, how the neurons are connected together. And so you can do this but you know it doesn't tell you anything about the function it just tells you that those cells are connected somehow now what they've done here is they've used a model to simulate the behavior of the neuron the activity of the neuron and then you know they're connected together so there's an assumption that they work together in a circuit and then you know you have these uh through these simulations they're able to show that c elegans and pacific uh, pristianchus pacificus have these two different connectomes, they behave in certain ways, and that these two cells are sort of homologous, I2 and NSM. I assume that there's one response for the prey, one response for the predator. So that's that's the way they did this. Um, at the same time, we expect that the XEFF index, which is something that they uh, calculate in this paper, can be used to reveal the importance of neurons for the functional evolution and degeneration of neural networks from a dynamic perspective. And so then the second data set that they use is this uh, data set uh, it was published a couple years ago where they were able to, so uh, C. elegans, for those of you who don't know, 99% of the uh, members of C. elegans, the different uh, organisms, are what they call hermaphroditic. So that means that they have both uh, eggs and they have sperm. So they fertilize, they self fertilize, and they ha they lay eggs. They don't need a, a partner to have uh, to lay eggs that are fertile, so they can produce their own offspring. Uh, and so, but this leads to a lot of what they call clone, clonal selfing, and it's not good for the species uh, diversity. So one percent of the population is composed of males, and males are very. Uh, you know, you can detect males, they have this interesting tail that looks like a little shovel, and that's the uh, where they, uh, you know, send their sperm out to some hermaphrodite that uh, they mate with. 
And so this is this male strategy exists so that the uh, C. elegans populations that do all the selfing don't uh, run out of genetic diversity. So we know that there two, there's the male, there's the hermaphrodite. The connectome that was originally um, constructed in the 1980s was on a hermaphrodite because it's the most common form of C. elegans. The males are much rarer and so people didn't really bother with the male connectome, but a couple years ago, there was a group that mapped out both connectomes, C. elegans or hermaphrodite and male. And so they're different, a little bit of difference in the um, connectome, but you know, they wanted to map it out to make sure that we had both. And so they took actually, this group took those two data sets and did some further analysis on it. So in the hermaphroditic and male C. elegans, we test the control level of the intermediate neuron group over the output neuron group and the single neuron. These results suggest that our theoretical approach can be used to reveal the effects of bioconnectivity groups, potentially enabling us to explore the interaction relationship of neural networks. So this is an interesting paper. They have these two different, so they have a, they start with this neural dynamics model. So this is a, an activation a function that can be used to describe the coupling mechanism among synapses, which is described here. It's a differential equation. You have the activity of the neuron I. I is, uh, capital I is the basal activity of the neuron, which is at rest. J is the maximal interaction strength between a pair of neurons, uh, which is where they're coupled. R is the inverse of the death rate. Alpha is the firing threshold. And so you can calculate this sort of activity and then how that activity in two different neurons that have some connection leads to their coupling, their, their act, activation coupling. And so there are a lot of ways you can do this. People have done this and this is, if you're thinking that this is something that you only need to, you know, that is only applicable to biological connectomes, uh, this is something you could apply to a neural network as well. And in fact, a lot of the activation functions for neural networks are not this complex, but they have uh, different, you know, a structure that's not too dissimilar from this. They don't usually use, you know, they don't usually use differential equations, but um, in any case, uh, so then they have this framework for network resilience, um, and then they have the simulation method, so they're using an ODE solver to uh, simulate this, they're using, which is an ordinary differential equation solver um, the data sets for neural networks. And now they're kind of using two different data sets here. They have a, use a connection matrix. Uh, so basically the uh, connectome comes in this uh, matrix of, you know, uh, values. You have all, it's sort of like an all to all matrix where you have pairwise comparisons and the pairwise comparisons have some value you know, it could be like a correlation coefficient. It could be some sort of uh, strength coefficient. Um, so, you know, a weight. So these are all like, this is depending on the data set that you get. Now, usually they capture it by looking at microscopy images, but you can actually derive a connection matrix using different criterion. And this is, this is a data set generated by Bumbarger. So this is something that already existed and they just used it for this case. Um, so this is an example here of the uh, C. elegans and Pristiancus. So this one is, I think this is C. elegans and this is Pristiancus. Yeah, so this is uh, the blue one here and this is the, so you can see that there are differences in the connectivity. Um, Pristiancus is a little bit more diffuse than C. elegans, C. elegans, more tightly connected in this area. Uh, I don't know what that means. That could mean that it's, you know, that could have some difference between predation and uh, being a prey. It could just be because that's, you know, there are diff behavioral differences in terms of what they're doing, uh, their behavioral repertoire. But they say here that they can detect these, um, differences, you know, that are due specifically to predator and prey, but there are other differences as well in these connectomes. And just to show an example of how the connectomes are connected, you have these hubs and you have these uh, peripheral nodes 
and the there's a functional distinction where the hubs are taking in a lot of connections from different places where they have you know very strong connections with certain neurons and others are not as strongly connected so you know that's something that's functionally um you know has some functional distinction too some cells are inner neurons where they're integrating a lot of things from motor neurons and sensory neurons and other you know other cells are you know just sensory neurons sensing one part of the environment or something like that and they're feeding forward their behavior so or their activity so uh, that's why they're structured in that way um, so yeah we have I think this is I don't think there's uh, okay. so this is the hermaphrodite versus the male uh, this is the hermaphrodite where you have this the sensory neuron and then you go to the muscle and in this case which is the male I believe uh, this is where you have a model of the inner neurons where you have sex specific cells sensory neurons and they go to the muscles so there's this difference in the hermaphrodite you just have the sensory neurons in uh, males you have this these sex specific cells that feed to the inner neurons and so that's that's all there is in that paper i think that's a nice paper that's a nice addition to literature okay so um I'm going to get into some other, a couple other papers. I just wanted to talk about some of this. Let's see, that was one. Okay, I just want to make sure I go through some of these. So this part of the meeting, I'm going to just go through a couple more papers, and then we'll wrap up. Um, but I want to get through this list. You can see we have this huge list. So the first one is this program flow paper. And this is, uh, the title is Program Flow. Programmed in Self-Organized Flow of Information During Morphogenesis. And this is uh, about morphogenesis. Um, and so the abstract reads, how the shape of embryos and organs emerges during development is a fundamental question that has fascinated scientists for centuries. Of course, we talk about that all the time in the group. Tissue dynamics arise from a small set of cell behaviors, including shape changes. So these are like neurons and their uh, interactions with other neurons. These are uh, cells that are undergoing morphogenesis in an embryo. And so there are a whole different set of interactions here. Uh, so shape changes, cell contact remodeling, cell migration, cell division, cell extrusion. So these are things that like, where cells move, they divide, they, they call extrusion, which means that they're things that are coming out from like a flat surface. So cells are, you know, taking on sort of a unique shape uh, as opposed to being a sphere. Um, these behaviors require control over cell mechanics, namely active stress is associated with protrusive contractile and adhesive forces and hydrostatic pressure, as well as the material properties. So there are all these different physical properties and also material properties. And so this is a review article where they address how cell mechanics and the associated cell behaviors are robustly organized in space and time during morphogenesis. Um, so they talk about, we, last week we talked about uh, gene regulatory networks. And so in this case, what they're doing is they're linking gene expression and biochemical cues to some of the mechanics and geometry that act as a source of morphogenetic information. And so this actually works at different time and length scale, what they call length scales, which are spatial distances so, you know, you have processes that happen amongst maybe a couple cells or processes that happen across maybe half of the embryo. And so there are all these different time and length scales that these things happen at. And so uh, then they have two idealized models of how this information flows, how it is read out and translated into a biological effect during morphogenesis. So the first model is a program, which is like a uh, differentiation program. And so the, this, you could think of this as like something that's programmed into the genome and then expressed, or something that is, you know, like follows a clock in every embryo. This kind of model follows deterministic rules in this hierarchical. The second model, however, follows the principles of self-organization, which rests on statistical rules characterizing a system's composition and configuration, local interactions and feedback. So the first one is like a program that's, you know, a top-down sort of uh, 
system. So, you know, imagine that, you know, you have some gene that's a, like a clock gene that tells the embryo when, it, when it's time to sort of, uh, you know, differentiate or, you know, uh, this, you know, uh, exhibit some sort of symmetry breaking. Uh, that's, that's a very uh, seductive model, but it doesn't really follow that this, all of this is programmed into the embryo. Now, in C. elegans, there seems to be a lot more of this programmatic, uh, programmatic uh, behavior than in other embryos, where you have a lot of cell-to-cell -cell signaling. But the second rule follows the principles of self-organization. So in some forms of development, this actually is much more common where you have cells that are signaling one another and you can have differentiation occur spontaneously as opposed to like at some point in development, like you see more with C. elegans actually. So these two modes to the mechanisms of four very general classes of tissue deformation are you know, discussed. So you have these four different types of tissue deformation and you have the two models that, so you have deterministic self-organization, and then you have these four different um, types of tissue manipulation. So uh, this, again, this is up here in this part, uh, shape changes, contact remodeling, cell migration, cell division, and cell extrusion. I guess, the, you know, that's five, but they kind of go on about, they talk about four. And so overall, we suggest a conceptual framework for understanding morphogenetic information that encapsulates, encapsulates genetics and biochemistry, as well as mechanics and geometry. And they think of this as information modules. So this is something that, uh, this is diverging from this idea that shape is encoded by genes and gene expression. This actually argues that there's an interplay between gene expression and these uh, physical forces. So, you know, they kind of go through a lot of things in this review. Um, I like, you know, a lot of these reviews that kind of go through some of these ideas uh, that, that influence uh, what they're talking about. So here in box one is the mosaic and regulative theories of development. So we've talked about this in the meetings where there's this mosaic uh, theory of development, which is based on this programmatic approach where, you know, you have these cells that sort of Think the events that unfold in development, and they're likely encoded in the genome. Um, so, you know, you have these, um, you know, where if you take a frog embryo and you uh, kill with a hot needle half of the two cell stage or the four cell stage, you end up with half an animal. So you end up with like, you can't like form the entire, we talked about, um, uh, flatworms last week, and we said that every cell in the flatworm is totipotent, meaning that any cell can form an entire ember, and form an entire organism on its own. In this case, this is the opposite of that. It's that every cell has to be in place. And if you knock out half of the cells very early in development, you end up with half an animal, half a frog. It's an interesting way to, you know, it, but this happens in C. elegans too. If you take the two cell stage, uh, embryo and you divide the, you take the cells apart and you grow them independently in a culture, you end up with really nothing. The cells divide, but they don't really form anything looking like a C. elegans. They have this, uh, they, they kind of unfold the way they're supposed to, but they don't really form anything. So it's an interesting uh, way to look at development by kind of intervening really early and looking at this, how this program sort of gets disrupted. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, there is this sort of regulative theory where, you know, you get, cell, like, you get the totipotent cells uh, that can form entire, em you know, entire embryos and entire organisms. You can also get cells that sort of spontaneously differentiate so they can form, you know, uh, they can form different uh, ad adaptive phenotypes. And so that's... Uh, what that is. And then they kind of get into morphogenetic information and some other things as well. Um, so two, two papers that follow up on that is the self-organized tissue regulation paper. And Susan will probably be interested in these references, so I want to send them along to her. But um, this paper focuses on amniodevelopment 
uh, it's just just amniote development, which is where you have uh, live births, any animal that can give live birth. Um, and this is a highly regulative and self-organized process. So here we're not talking about organisms that have this programmatic type of development, but other types of, uh, you know, amniotic uh, organisms that have, like us or like mice, uh, that have this regulative and self-organized type of development. And so um, this paper is, this kind of talks about self-organized tissue mechanics and regulation. They talk about uh, gene expression, but only sort of uh, obliquely. So they talk about, um, you know, in this case, they're talking about analyzing intact and mechanically perturbed avian embryos. We show that mechanical forces that drive embryogenesis self-organize in an analog of Turing's molecular reaction diffusion model. So they're using this model of Turing's molecular reaction diffusion. Uh, they're using an analog of it with, with contractility locally self-activating in the ensuing tension and acting as a long-range inhibitor. These mechanical feedbacks govern persistent patterns of tissue flows that shape the embryo and steers the contaminant emergence of embryonic territories by modulating gene expression. So they talk about gene expression only obliquely. They talk about it in terms of what the uh, forces are doing and how they're affecting gene expression. So, you know, there are a lot of ways you can affect gene expression by, you know, the cell doing, behaving, doing things. I misspoke about amniotes. They're not actually live births. They have this amniotic sac. So birds that lay eggs also have this, uh, are amniotes as well. So just, just a clarification there. I didn't want to, but in, in any case, it's, it's not the same thing as like the programmatic development. Um, so this is the, yeah, this, this is kind of a nice paper that kind of lays out a model for sort of this mechanical uh, aspect of development and then kind of getting into how they relate to gene regulation, but not uh, so much so that it focuses on genes, just kind of how it affects some of these regulators and then their activity. So here you can see an example. Uh, their model is that you have these forces, contractility, tension, you have the expression of GDF1 here in this case, where contractility is, is driving it, tension is uh, inhibiting it, and then you have embryo formation. And you can see here that there's this relationship between tension and contractility, which is where you have two different mechanical forces interacting. And then it, it, you know, it describes this reaction diffusion model where you have regulation of what the tissue is doing in this in this space um, yeah that's a very definitely um a good reference for me to have okay yeah i'll send you all these in uh you know at the end of the meeting and then finally this dynamic transmission of positional information in drosophila embryogenesis so this is moving now back to drosophila which is the uh you know our fruit fly model and this is, uh, this type of development is more programmatic. And there's a mix, a lot of times in organisms, there's a mix between the programmatic type of development and the regulative type of development. So C. elegans has a little bit of regulative development, which is where uh, you get things like uh, post-hatch, when they hatch out of their egg, there's some uh, cell differentiation there that's regulative. But uh, Drosophila has uh, somewhat of a programmatic approach. Um, and it's, you know, so you can like track cells. They, you know, there's this uh, cellularization phase. So it's an interesting model for embryogenesis. It's very different from C. elegans, but also very different from, say, like humans and birds and even uh, fishes. So, um, so this is the abstract here. It is suggested that stuff and style is key in controlling the variability of the posterior boundary of the HB anterior domain. So these are all like gene expression uh, defined uh, sections of the embryo. So these uh, HB anterior domain is a section of the uh, embryo in, in Drosophila. However, the mechanism that underlies this control is elusive. So they don't know what controls this uh, you know, they don't know what controls this process. 
but they know that there's this sort of spatial restriction in this part of the posterior embryo. And they know there's some sort of control by this factor, but they don't know what the mechanism is. So here we quantified the dynamic 3D expression of segmentation genes in Drosophila embryos. So again, this is where you have genes. We talked about Hox genes where you have like the spatial restriction of their expression. And so they get expressed in different segments of the embryo. And Drosophila is a very good model for this because you can actually see this process unfold uh, very clearly. And so they, but people don't really, maybe they don't fully understand the process behind this. How do you go from like gene expression to these uh, physical stripes? You know, is it like, um, is it that the cells in those regions are favored to, to you know, express one gene over another? Or is it this, that there's a lot of uh, gene expression product that's, you know, um, sort of produced and then, you know, in a gradient and then the gradient is sort of restricted by interactions amongst genes uh, or amongst, uh, you know, cells are making different concentrations of it and there's this sort of uh, order that happens at the level of the uh, embryo. So that, you know, that's that's the question that we're asking. And of course, people have developed models for this. So there's the reaction diffusion model, which can create striping. And there are other types of models that can do the same sort of thing. In this case, they're interested in something called positional information, which is where each cell has like some sort of positional information. They know in the embryo where they are. And so from that positional information, you can say, um, this is, you know, what I should be expressing. And then there's the striping that occurs. So they're able to quantify the 3D expression of segmentation genes with improved control of measurement error. We show that this uh, this uh, factor, these that they, they created a mutant to uh, get them to not express this uh, factor. So there's, when they put this minus sign here, that means that it's a knockout and that you know that gene has been removed. So um, when you have mutants like that, they won't be producing this factor. And so then you can look and see what happens when that factor is not produced. And so in this case, in, for the knockouts, reproducibility moves posteriorly by 10% of the embryo length compared to the wild type, which is the one that has the functional gene that you haven't manipulated. So this means that there's this, uh, in the mutants, this, uh, expression moves posteriorly by 10% of the embryo length. So there's a displacement in terms of the positional information. And so, the, you know, maybe that's suggestive of something. Um, this very, is this variability over short time windows is comparable to that of the wild type. Uh, moreover, Stow negative mutants, the upstream bicoid gradients, which are these gradients of expression, uh, show equivalent relative int intensity noise to that of the wild type. And, down, and the downstream even skipped and cephalic furrow show that the same positional errors as these factors in the wild type. So these uh, even skipped and cephalic furrow are other genes that are being expressed in different parts of the embryo and different stripes. And if you, uh, you know, if you modify one gene, one factor here, uh, these other genes will be shifted in different ways. And so there's this positional information that is essentially disrupted and shifted across the embryo. So this is, interesting. this is an interesting link between positional information and the expression of different factors that are uh, being expressed in the cell. And actually just one factor because this stout negative mutant is showing all of these different uh, positional shifts. They call them positional errors, but you know, uh, our results indicate that the threshold dependent activation and self-organized filtering are not mutually exclusive and could be both implemented in early Drosophila embryogenesis. So this is uh, Drosophila. I don't know if they show any images here, but this is, uh, you know, a good model of embryogenesis. Um, and, you know, this is a nice model because it allows you to investigate a lot of this uh, you know, gene expression and this connection to positional information. And so that's basically what they found there. So, you know, that's, that's a, 
sort of support for this positional information hypothesis and you know how it's modified when you change um, the location of genes. You also, so positional information maybe is more connected to that mosaic mode of development. So you can think of it like, you know, if you have this sort of, you know, mosaic mode of development where there's a program, the program will tell it, well, at different points in development, you know, this gene should be expressed in this location and so forth. In a self-organized model, you could imagine that there's more of this regulative mode where, you know, you don't really have a lot of positional information, at least it's local, it's not global. So, I mean, you know, there, there are different ways that you can look at embryo development. Uh, oh, Dick is here. Hello, Dick. Uh, and I know I've been working oh. these papers. I just haven't <laughs> gone back to the... Uh, Thurun, okay, you did that. Asmit said, I had another meeting. Would I have to drop off. This looks really interesting. Be great if you could share the papers on Slack. I'll do that. I also share them with Susan because she requested them. And then Richard says, sharks and guppies of live births. Okay, yeah, so I, yeah. <laughs> Anything, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated. But the point is, is that there's this group called amniotes, and they have this amniotic sac, and so one of the clades of uh, life, and so that was the, yeah, but I don't want to, <laughs> there are always exceptions in biology um, and different things like that. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's good. I think we're done for today. Did anyone have anything else they wanted to add? I know there was a lot of papers and uh, things. I wanted to go through some of those and crunch through them. Uh, so I know last week we talked about uh, the uh, sort of the gene regulatory networks of Eric Davidson. And we kind of got, we didn't really wrap that up. We kind of said, well, what I said, well, I proposed that we need some sort of experimental system for computational gene expression networks. And so this is something that um, I might talk about in future meetings, um, but that's, you know, there's this, uh, I think that if you could implement gene expression networks computationally and do it really well, I think there's a lot of potential for like, you know, developing different types of biological models that we could understand uh, these systems a bit better. Um, and then, you know, with, and then we, you know, and then I kind of shifted the focus this week to some of the mechanical elements and some of the mechanical mechanisms that are going on in development. And then linking those to the gene expression and the mechanical aspects. And it's a, I think that's also something that, you know, we can follow up on in future meetings. Um, and I think it's also something that I don't think people have really developed good computational models for. I know experimentalists are developing computational models for like their model system, but to have like a first principles type model is, which means first principles means you're developing it from some principle that you propose by looking at all these organisms and saying, I think this is how it works, let's do this. And then you try it and you know, it works well or it doesn't. And so. Um, I have, uh, access to a paper, I could send you a paper about blood vessels and flow of blood and how uh, flow of blood and pressure uh, keep a blood vessel intact. And when you don't have flow, then you lose the phenotype for the um, endothelial cells lining the blood vessels. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've heard of this, like where uh, they do this in regenerative medicine, where they have, you know, they have like the cell and it's in, in some, they'll, they'll put like a stem cell in some location in like an organ and like it has to be in that niche, they call it a uh, niche. And then like, if it's not in there, it won't, differ if it's in the niche, it'll maybe differentiate into the cell type and it'll maintain its... Uh, phenotype, but if it doesn't have all the cues that it needs, if it's in, you know, if it's not in the right place in the niche or if it's in a, you know, a weird location, it won't uh, differentiate. So there are a lot of weird things going on with like, you know, when you put a stem cell into a organ, say, if you do a stem cell transplant, you can, you really have to be, you know, it's really kind of a crapshoot. You know, you have to get it just in the right place. You have to get the right chemical cues, right physical cues. Um, and, you know, 
like that. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to see that paper. Anything else? Yeah, so I'll send you that. Okay, yeah. Paper. Yeah, Dick, earlier we were talking about some of the, uh, it's actually uh, uh, Azmet and Ujwal who did this uh, original Basilaria paper that we did. And then uh, Tharun, who's another person from who joined the group this year, they're working on the uh, Basilaria data. Um, they're taking another shot at it and they're trying to find, like they're trying to build a good model for motion. So they're looking at, they're, you know, trying to do a, they're using a certain algorithm that uh, should pick up a lot of the motion cues. Yeah. So, I, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll wait and see how they do. They're, they're not quite done yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, what you were talking about, check my comment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in the chat, yeah. So, yeah. Steve Smith's articles on whether or not an ox axolotl is a need for a heart. Yeah. Okay. Susan, I think you need to pay attention to that. It might be worth following up Steve Smith's stuff. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll look at it. I'll try to find it. If I can't find it, I'll um, yeah. send you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, Steve's, Steve's been, yeah. Uh, anyway, Steve, Steve gave lectures on whether or not heart is necessary. And uh, he had a mutant which was heartless. And it still lived. <laughs> I, I think mammals need the heart because well, they, mammals they, 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 at least the young animal. This yeah. is a theory. The 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 heart is a um, mechanically more solid tissue when it contracts, and so oh, you know, well, I, I was talking about your um, it, it, if if you have an axolotl without a heart, there's no pressure, and it'd be interesting to know what happens to the blood vessels, which I don't think Steve examined. Yeah, they they might not form properly. They might not form, or they might not they might not last. And I think this was only the uh, tadpole stages. Okay, I'll definitely find that paper on the. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. What was that last part? I didn't. It cut out. Oh, he was in, He he lived in his last. The last place he worked was Brandon. Oh, okay. Brandon, Brandon in Manitoba. Manitoba. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Brandon has a university, so. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I had him come to the University of Manitoba and give a lecture on this. But that's probably about 20 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's it for today. Um, thanks for attending and uh, welcome, Karam. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, we can talk about it on email or Slack and I'll send those papers out to Susan and you know, maybe, yeah, we can continue this discussion a bit. I, yeah, we'll have to look into those papers on the uh, Steve Smith's papers and maybe some stuff on blood vessels. So, okay. <laughs> all right. Talk to you later. Okay. Have a good week. Okay, bye. Bye.